So hi there everyone, welcome to uh, Tam's Journey's first interview. Uh, we have the rather lovely orange boy Lord Moore here, um, a fantastic artist with a wonderful history and a passion for neurodiversity, emotions and creativity. So George, um, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so yeah, I'm 26 years old as of two days ago and my history of art started when I was at Great Ormond Street Hospital which is where they started their arts therapy program. So they started rolling it out on the wards. So my first engagement with arts was on the hospital wards and making art. And they've been using it to kind of educate their, their patients about their own health conditions as well as to distract them from things that are going on around them. And since then, my art has always been about uh, understanding myself, understanding others. So basically I see artwork as a portal to humanity and to understand other people and their own conditions or issues that are facing society. So when I went off to art school, my work became very much centered around um, sociology and sensory processing and how the art material can communicate almost be like a what's the word? how the material can represent an emotion and how that's related to neurodivergence as well yeah that's really interesting so your early childhood experiences really shaped this passion for art and you obviously found a way to process whatever was going on for you as a child in that position through the creative process um, as a practitioner while I understand that um, our sensory involvement in art and creativity can be extremely therapeutic and we can use that as a way to um, harm the neural pathways and um, create something um, to represent ourselves and to use all the different senses, it, you know, music, um, drama, uh, there's so many different areas that can be creative um, but sadly are sort of more restricted nowadays. Did you find in a mainstream school you had any problems accessing a wide variety of art and creativity? I would say uh, mainstream schools, are saying they, the funding for arts is definitely going down. Mm. I mean, if you look into like... Um, so I've recently been talking to someone who works at Autism Anglia. Okay. Which is a, like, oh, it's like a school setting to oh, people okay. with autism. And uh, that was set up by parents yeah. several decades ago yeah. because there's not enough funding for pe by the council to provide funds to support people. And if that's not being provided by schools or people need additional needs, it, it's people you know, independent independent organisation having to set up uh, set that up. Yeah. So I kind of feel the core subjects are only really being supported at school. But then that doesn't allow you to kind of express yourself in a healthy way, I feel. No, because of course in an educational structure you're working for target grades yeah, and giving a brief. Because it's a database, it's evidence yeah. based and it's database. And, and one thing that I find very interesting, and I work sometimes over a long period of time with a young person when, you know, a lot of models work on a six week program. Um, you know, one of the cases took two years to engage because I had to smile at her for two years, walking up and down the corridor while she swore at me. So <laughs> no one would fund that work because it's too time consuming, but she's off to uni soon to do a paramedic course. So it's actually really a value. Um, I think with creativity and art and that emotional link, you can't put a time limit on it and you can't put a structure to it because it's so individual and it's so unique and it's such a personal journey. It really comes from a place of sense and identity that trying to access that, trying to create things that are 
so accessible to such a wide range of personalities, such a diverse range of personalities. Um, from, a, from a parent point of view, when Abby went off to uni, I think it was the first time I ever felt she was in an environment where she was with her tribe because everybody was so different and so unique. <laughs> wasn't a type nobody worked towards i know with a degree you have a framework there was yeah. such a lot of a expression lot flexible, yeah. and it's a lot more flexible but we don't have that as standard in education no not at all yeah i think mainstream education is very much inaccessible especially if you're kind of if you've got any kind of health or learning uh, not disability as such but difference in way of thinking and then that's not acknowledged yeah. you're going to yeah. Yeah. and then that then affects your confidence self-esteem then that then affects your ability of employment accessing employment yeah. because you're totally misunderstood so it doesn't just affect yeah. you expressively yeah. it affects your employment as well so that's why i think creative isn't just about creativity or art it's about employment your you know your ability to communicate or for other people to understand how they can communicate with others and that's how I feel like when people ask me what art means to me and I'm I, my answer is not normally what people expect but to make something is first and foremost one of our earliest forms of communication we were drawing before we had the alphabet it's simple as that it's primal we've been doing it since the word go as a way of getting our stories ourselves out there and some of this work like you see it on the news like cave paintings have survived the test of time and we are able to learn from these images without the need of an abc or an alphabet like words aren't necessary aren't necessary there are other ways of communicating and that's how i've always seen it mm. it's instinct it's primal it has been with us always and the education system it's completely stripping it out. Like I actually, um, and we've spoken about this before, I really struggled with uni at first. I did my diploma first because I suddenly went from such a structured, intense course where you had to follow their brief to whatever the hell you want. Just yeah. follow that brief. And I'm like, well, what is the brief? It was like, well, oh, just do that, but put your own flair on it. Yeah, and you just <laughs> like, you sat there tearing your hair out. Like, and then they just sit down and look at you. It's like, you need to think for yourself. <laughs> How? Like, because it's so drummed into your system. And it just goes to show how much of you is pulled out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yes. When I look back at my early works at art school, I, don't, I didn't realise what they were about at all. No, I mean? Yeah, we were clearing out my uni work and I'm just sort of like, oh, look, it's a leaf. Then I think I, when after going through like therapy, I actually realised what my works were about, even as subconsciously. Yeah, and no, I, I, you start to pin things together and you think, oh, it that's what sense. that means. Yeah. yeah. And I, I was communicating something to myself, whether I knew it or not. And it's like, it I think you communicate, I think for artists, you either communicate something externally or you communicate something from internally. Yeah. Yeah. I think it my depends work. where that yeah. yeah it depends where your locus is that, yeah. that sort of area that you work from I so think um, I, I think I I from like my work is quite sociological based so I then yeah. Yeah. take things from outside but I used it from the perspective of my own experiences I think that's how I would describe it so you very kindly sent us some of your some of your pictures of some of your art shall I have a flick through and you can sort of is the background to them yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go, the, by the magic of Zoom, I'm going to click here. And then which one would you like first? Um, let's do... Let's do the Precious Boys. Yay. Yeah. I have to say, this is one of my favourites. I still don't even know how it came about fully. Like, it's just so... It was such a random piece of work that I made, just through play, really. But um, I think 
when I look back, it all started when I used to go for these random midnight walks. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> his magical walks. Yeah, I think I was writing loads, I was writing loads of poetry at the time I was making this, quite a lot. And it was all about how the um, experience of alienation, isolation and loneliness in society and about how I think I was reflecting on throughout history as well, how people are kind of forced into this sense of belonging in society. If you look at a war, how men were drafted off into war and they were told it'd be a holiday, but in reality, that it wasn't at all. It was a very traumatic experience. So I was kind of comparing this whole, because I just see it as a field. To me, that is just the image for me was almost like a field of these lonely bodies existing mm -hmm. in a space, that's kind of quite depressed or decaying bodies, like just lying on the ground. Mm -hmm. They just represent their torsos. And I was really interested in the, um, there's a painting by um, Goya, where there's yeah. two boys standing, blowing up sheep's bladders. And it's all about that experience of like childhood and um, youth of just, there's no pressure as such, but they're just playing around, but there's a sense of danger and death, but also that growing awareness of like sexual expression as well. Mm. This, to me, this piece of work is just a nursery rhyme, telling that tale of that kind of internal confusion, but as well the um, kind, of, kind of confliction in society and how that can make people feel quite isolated. Actually, every single one of these, um, every single one of these little statuettes is, uh, is unique and different, isn't it? Yeah. Each one is a each one is randomly made, so each one is completely different to the to another, and they're all randomly placed as well in a gallery setting too. Like there's no every time it's it's exhibited, it's different, even down to the colour because it's all dependent on the temperature of the room and the amount of pigment I use too, and it can change due to the sun sunlight on top of the work. Yes, and you had this at the um, burner in Maidstone, didn't you? Uh, in in Margate. Margate. Yeah, yeah and because they have loads of they have a direct sunlight. As the sun sets, you get the full beam of sun on it, and it was changing colour over time, which was quite interesting. So I was taking pictures over time, seeing so, you know, it changing. Yeah, no, it was beautiful. We loved, we yeah, loved it when we came day, to yeah. see it. Okay, which one's next? Um, let's do... Whoa, I think... Let's do symptomology, the second one. Yeah, that one. Okay. Right, talk us through this one. Um, so this one I made in 2018, I think. And this was displayed at the South End Museum. And I think this piece is basically all around how, how stoicism and emotional suppression, especially in post-industrial towns like Basildon, can really cripple um, our ability to develop emotionally as children mm -hmm. and how societal expectations and gender roles. So for example, with men specifically, how that's now caused many men to kind of be focused in terms of their output as their body so for example muscles torso abdomens and this piece is made using like gym supplement products mm -hmm. and it was all to do with how in south end there was a hotel where um it was used as a convalescence home for soldiers during the war okay and as they were healing um the women within the town would throw flowers up to them as like a sign of like get well soon so if you look in detail in the image there's um like loads of um pressed flowers also there's images of boxing imagery and uh close-ups of bodies as well cool. so i was kind of exploring the the femininity behind this kind of quite vulnerable person behind that image of the muscle man Right. They are vulnerable people yeah. that portray themselves to being quite um, basically 
I would say men have become ornamental, but behind that is something very vulnerable. And, yeah. and that's something that's being communicated just by through reality TV as well now. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the media has a, a lot to answer for. Um, lovely, thank you. It's really interesting, and I'm really interested in that um, link to the South End Recovering Soldiers, because the expectation on their masculinity must have been huge when actually they were recovering from trauma. Hmm. You know, so, so it would be a real, you know, there would be a real dichotomy between, you know, their, their recovery and expectation. So in the in the actual exhibition at South End, I had um, those sort of notes from art psychotherapy about trauma uh -huh. and history as well, how trauma had been documented in art. So people making Crimean war quilts. Right. Because the repetitive notion of making a quilt could be yes. therapeutic for someone. Yeah. And we know that touch comes into that because it's a sense that's then used and the, and the seeing the patterns and the colours and the feel of the fabric would have been really therapeutic. We understand that more now. Um, that's really interesting, lovely. I think that's why in those paintings for me, the detail I find quite therapeutic. Mm. I think the most exciting bit is actually the finishing of it. Yeah. It's all the all the detail yeah 100 percent, and that's and quite rightly so because that's how our body sort of heals and softens so okay what do we next position or intimacy uh intimacy because it's quite current and relevant now i think okay so this piece i finished yesterday Ooh, uh, so this is a um this is an exclusive exclusive here on the tams journey channel so this one, I think, because as I mentioned earlier, I think my work is, I see my work as kind of like acts of empathy to understand other people. And I think something I really, like, especially in the last couple of weeks, is that you, with this whole situation with this pandemic, is you kind of, it's changed people in terms of how they express themselves, I think. I mean, if you look online, I kind of feel that, um, also it's not just, it's how, yeah, who do we see as vulnerable in society? Yes. How do we communicate vulnerability in society? It's not necessarily related to health or it's more to do with experience, I think, vulnerability. And so this piece is all about how certain members of or sectors of society are more likely to experience the loneliness mm -hmm. and then how that's going to affect them in terms of their mental health, especially as social distancing measures are being brought in our interpretation and experience of intimacy is being completely changed and who i've met a lot of individuals who how do we who let's who access intimacy perhaps in a different way to other people for example in heteronormative societies where's um the couple is embraced more in for example in queer society that's not less so common Mm -hmm. so where there's the kind of lockdown they're more likely to be affected by social distancing measures and they're more likely to experience loneliness so for me this piece of work ex explores how that sense of longing in the person but there's that awareness of danger and risk because of this whole issue around the virus and yes. how it's affecting people mentally so in this image at the bottom is how there's the sense of risk and the awareness of death because in detail there's um, newspaper cuttings of um, people being carried away to hospital or in masks or in overalls mm -hmm. and they rise up to the very top where the angels are carrying them off to heaven in a way for a sense of peace and contentment and it's about how as a society do we look out for other people who we not necessar necessarily regard as vulnerable really interesting it's really interesting because perception and viewpoint especially around the isolation in the media something i noticed that was really interesting was fantastic captain moore who's raised 30 million it is now today for the nhs um and i thought um 
I mean, he's, he's what an amazing role model. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it was quite sad. So there were a couple of memes on the internet that were comparing him with Sam Smith had had a really emotional moment that he'd shared on social media. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I thought it was very sad. It was being touted that one way was preferable to another way. Yeah, that exactly. he was in somehow less of a person because he expressed emotion while having a privileged lifestyle. And yet, you know, if we go back to basics with the fight and flight responses, you know, one has clearly has a, has a strong flight element. One clearly has a strong fight element. Both totally um, acceptable in their own right. As, yeah. as, a, as some areas in society would perceive that as not okay and wondrous and something to be applauded, which it is, but I would argue that both states are absolutely okay. And, and we should be we should be a little bit more aware of that. I thought it was really sad to mock someone um, who was being openly emotional and you know trying to have that conversation about mental health, and it was knocked aside um, because the perception is that that is that is the preferred the other route is the preferred route. I think it's interesting you mention that because. That was a main piece, main motivator for this piece of work. Wow, well, uh, that, that's what I thought of when I saw I, it. I was quite annoyed with how Ricky Gervais actually called out Sam Smith. Yeah. I was actually quite annoyed, to be honest, because I don't think your privilege necessarily means that you're given less or more permission to express yourself. <laughs> no, 100%. And for me, it's about, from what I gathered from that video, that Smith put up was that one's experience of isolation doesn't mean they're less means they should be given more permission to express themselves I think if they're on their own yeah and he would yeah. have he would have subconsciously spoken to a lot of men actually mm -hmm. and certainly maybe more in some communities than others um social groups Relevant, he, he's still allowed to have that voice. I think. Okay, right. Last one then, this position. Yeah, so this one was made in 2018 as well, I think. And this is kind of a similar sort of subject matter to the one before, actually, with. Um, I think I was reading, I think I made this piece of work when there was a lot of news articles about how young men were being murdered through dating apps and how they were being groomed and how I think, I, I think our education around sex is very much inadequate in society. I think it is it, tailored towards certain members and demographics. I think it doesn't, I don't think it rep represents um, people who are disabled or from different identities. I think, how do people then, people often seek out education themselves for, for online. Also, if people then aren't, I would say, if people aren't, I think, it's, I think, if people are trying to find out answers online, that to me proves that education isn't providing the right means for people to learn, or they're not discussing important things that we need to know. I think down to consent in education is not, I don't feel is enough because, I mean, personally, I feel that we should all be learning it should be made compulsory at school that everyone should learn basic sign language as well as learning about how to communicate with people with learned disabilities or because consent is about un both parties understanding mm. both agree how can you do that if you don't understand somebody else's needs and it doesn't just fall in it, it falls into so many categories in society about how we communicate with each other and how we mitigate experiences it evolves around how we understand each other and that, that can't be done unless you do not understand someone's needs or, and how you communicate with somebody. 
to, so for me that work is all about how we need to create a better understanding of emotional expression and education in order to prevent people from coming into harm and that brings us back to sort of the central point of our shared our shared passions which is about neurodiversity emotional expression and understanding and that creativity um you know and bringing all those things together i mean i've seen some line i've seen some lovely makaton singing groups mm. so there are more and more things coming and i know you're very much interested in accessibility um for people with neurodiverse conditions and then that conversation about consent is, is really important in terms of accessibility to know what people are finding accessible and what people are not finding accessible um i know you you know you're doing some research for a research project you're doing around accessibility and even thinking um you know we went to an exhibition in a well-known gallery in london and um i think you'd said one of the you know are they accessible well they had put on accessible sessions but they were like at nine o'clock in the morning they had an autistic screening I and mean, it's not just autistic people who would need a quiet area you know people with some hearing people with some visual impairment people with sensory processing um you know so people with dyspraxia might find you know with mobility issues so many different areas not necessarily autistic screening a neurodiverse section would be good but again this was at nine o'clock in the morning the majority of people that go into london have traveled from somewhere else mm -hmm. so you're at peak train times so you're having to pay more for train tickets or stay over so while on paper it looks like we offer a lovely accessible thing but only when it's convenient actually them. it's not really very accessible <laughs> unless you live in london and you can get up really early and get there yeah you're only autistic because that's what's on the ticket yeah. um so i think there's we such, still in, a long way to go yeah. isn't there we went in during the normal times and obviously as you know i'm I'm ASD and adhd and it was chaos yeah it was because it was the two it was the two come in exhibition wow. the final oh no <laughs> that would have been heat. and I think... there were just people everywhere yeah i think some people feel like a lot of these sessions are almost like they're just tokens. Yeah. yeah. You're not actually being given what I would class as agency or autonomy no. in the museum. It's, it's... And I think if museums expect people to come to them, like a good example I would like to say is like, you want people to come to you to say, you know they want to make this more accessible but if they're issues of communication then probably not going to come to you to say that you need to you, if you're publicly funded you need to go off your own back and, and research and find out how you can make your things more accessible you shouldn't be relying on other people to communicate that to you yeah uh, young people and and people who are neurodivergent having a voice having agency is really important and sometimes that creativity is a communication tool but if we're not expanding on that, really, I, I hope that this current situation seems to have tapped into so many people's inner creativity. Um, because there's some fantastic things happening. Um, I know kids have got to do the schoolwork, but I'm seeing, I'm seeing out in the world, even even basic things as the rainbows. We're communicating to our key workers with a creative image. You know, children are getting a lot of pleasure out of that. They're communicating without having to speak. And it comes back to that our first way of communicating. One of our first ways was the drawings and the pictures. And, and there's quite a bit of that going on at the moment, which is really interesting. I think it's very much like how I see how the ways in which we see affection as well. Like okay. if you look at Peter Pan, the actual for example oh, the thimble. thimble for me thimble. for me the artwork is the thimble yeah because and do you know what my husband's neurodiverse and he's not massively tactile okay um <laughs> but 
every morning my coffee pot and my cup is next to the kettle yeah. and that tells me more than he could ever tell me with his words it's little it's the little things and it's gestures isn't it sometimes i think in like um especially in queer culture to pitch throw up a bit topic it's such a there's such immediacy in it and everything's rushed and i mean i've had a conversation with people who because because now most people most queer people they meet through online you know interactions and but that doesn't allow people who have sensory processing who might need more time to get used to someone that doesn't give people like that agency to or permission to have expression in society and and on top of that, it's also about the danger and risks associated with that as well. Yeah. Because you're not taking the time to understand somebody else. But it's also how queer culture is still very much only represents, you know, white, fully able gay men. And that is mainly still issue with that. Yeah. And it's very much very non-disabled when you look in terms of representation. There's very, very few, mm. I'd say, disabled representations. For me, it's more to do with how we shame people if they don't yeah. express affection in the way that other people should, how, how they understand it. So you're told, um, my ways of expressing it is going to be different for somebody else. Mm. If I tell somebody a reason, something personal, it's not me telling you, I want you to relate to that. It's me telling you, I want to, you to adjust your communication for me so that I can understand you, you can understand me. Because often our conflicts in society and misunderstandings actually come about because of communication. Yeah. And if we can change that, I feel like a lot of misunderstandings in society would be addressed. Mm. And also the whole guilt and shame around affection too would be addressed as well yeah it's quite interesting because there's been some discussion recently around whether we should make uh, young children kiss people goodbye or give them a hug you know it's very much um it's very much led by adult isn't it still kiss nanny goodbye give nanny a hug um we've started saying with our obviously because we've thought of it more I, I, I would have done the same, you know, say goodbye to Nan, give her a cuddle. Um, with our with our youngest niece now, yeah. it's, um, do you have any kisses left today? We say, do you have any kisses left today? And she'll, sometimes she'll go, no, no. And she'll sometimes she'll go, yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, you can have a hug. Um, so it's sort of her choice, really. So we, it's not been forced onto her. And um, actually, I think she's more affectionate for it. Um, I think she's more physically affectionate for it, but also I think she, she communicates more with a look, you know, and, and I think when you're not doing that, it's something she can, you know, she can communicate through a little cheeky look just as much as she can, you know, through, but I mean, that's, that's sort of coming back to touch and communication. And I, Lucy George, I think we could probably do, three hours every week of recording and still never ever get to the end of a conversation i can't even begin to imagine how many current topics we've actually hit on today um <laughs> i could sit here all day but i'm not sure everybody wants to listen to us all day um i'm keen to get this up on the youtube channel and sort of get some feedback from people i'm not going to be able to comments on i think because i have to click the not for children button this won't work on Facebook. We'll can get some feedback from people, and um, you know, let's see if we can't get a really good conversation going about emotions, creativity, and neurodiversity. Sounds good. Ah, uh, so it's so lovely to see you. I'm so excited to see where your work takes you, and I will be promoting you all over the social yeah. media world. Yeah. Not that I have a huge amount of followers. I have five subscribers on my youtube channel <laughs> so you no know, um hopefully your lovely face will get me a few more and uh like i say it's, we're all on a journey yeah, and you're and for promotional purposes george this is just another step yeah we're going to use you to promote 
Now, make ourselves look good. You can hit her. <laughs> <laughs> I can hit her for you. Uh, so good luck with all your research. Uh, if you need any more, give me a link that I can put on social media so you can get some more feedback for you. And um, anything we can do that will help. Thank you very much, for your help. George. Take care, George. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.